I'm getting old, but I've been collecting for a long time. That's how it began. Maybe other people had the moment that I had. I was on a baseball diamond in Rockbridge Bath. I kicked a rock, and up came an arrowhead. So I thought, an arrowhead. And that was kind of the beginning of an interest that's kind of wax and wane, but been pretty strong ever since 1968. In 1970, I was walking through the Triburk Country Club where I trespassed regularly. <laughs> and they were going from eight holes to 16, and I don't play golf, I don't know anything about it. But they had bulldozed the side off of a hill and it had rained the night before. And I walked in and the whole hillside was covered with quartzite and flint debitage. And I realized what I'd seen and I started to pick up things. And by the end of the month, I'd found about 200 pieces. Now, my mother worked at Virginia Military Institute, and uh, she was a reference library. She said, you need to get to Jack Reeves. You talked about the digs at Gathright. Jack and McCord were together on that, Colonel John Reeves. He was really a biology professor, and I'd never met him. And my mom said, Give, he wants, Colonel Reeves wants all of your artifacts in a box, and I'll take them to him at work. He'll look at them for a week, and then he wants to bring you in and talk to you about them. So a week went by. My mom said, it's time to go to Colonel Reeves' office. He says, you've really found something here. And when I got there, I got my first lesson in Big Jack. Everything that I had found had been put into an envelope with a name and a date range on it. And I said, what do you think of my arrowheads? He said, they're not arrowheads, Pete. The second time that I said arrowheads, he said, these are projectile points. I'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> so Colonel Reeves really took me under his wing, and I was pretty well versed in artifact archaeology by the time I was 12 because of him. He used a time scale that had been generated by Dr. Joffrey Coe of the University of North Carolina. He wrote a book called The Formative Cultures of the Carolina Piedmont. And what he had done, he had excavated dozens of sites stratigraphically where he knew that the stratigraphy was intact. And he went down through the layers and he did carbon dating of each layer. And what he found was at every level in that temporal time span, of that level that the point cells were remarkably identical and he developed a sequencing of points from about 10,000 years ago until contact whatever we think that is whenever the Spanish maybe came into North Carolina and killed everybody for smallpox uh, and published that and so that sequence has held up remarkably he came up with it in the mid-50s based on about a half dozen sites. This kind of research has been expanded upon uh, in subsequent years, but my point is that stone tools are made very conservatively by the groups that make them, and each person in that group made them that way. And in that time span, that's the tool. And this is probably enforced with a lot of cultural pressure. In other words, you didn't just go off and do your own thing. This is how we do them, which might even imply an animistic connection. I don't know about that. Anyway, so Jack kind of got me educated in that stuff, and then the testosterone hit a few years later, and I sort of lost interest in this stuff for a while. But I came back to it a few years later, and I was always picking up things. Everything in these frames I picked up, in the 60s, 70s, some in the 80s, and a little bit in the 90s. I kind of lost interest in picking things up, but I really wasn't a field searching collector. I would just find things. Scott Silsby, one of my teachers in this stuff, says this stuff comes to you, and I'm kind of proof of it, because I got a whopping collection without really looking that much. I guess I got lucky, and it was the right time to be doing those things. As he said, you don't have a lot of ground disturbance now to work with. So you look around the bases of trees and things like that. If you're so inclined, I've moved on to something different. 
In 2005, I was looking through the back of Primitive Archer magazine, and there was an ad in the back, and it said, Altera Napin, Rennick, West Virginia. And I thought, man, that sounds interesting. It had never occurred to me that modern people would make things, because I was never into the sale of artifacts or any of that kind of stuff. I didn't know much about it. And so I drove over there with my girlfriend, and we drove in, and we got to the top of the hill, and there are 25 people around a campfire, and they're all cracking rocks apart. And this was my first exposure to modern flint napping. I didn't know anything about it. So these people were all really cool, and there was like, they really took you under their wing and tried to educate you on how to do this stuff. So I went to this thing for four years without ever cracking a rock. I watched. I made friends, I brought my artifacts. At the end of the fourth year, I said, I'm starting to look like some weird tourist. So I better start doing this stuff or they're gonna weird out on me. So I went and I bought a copper bopper, which is what most modern nappers use to nap with. And I bought a bunch of heat treated flint on the internet and I started bashing away. And when you learn to nap, all you need to know is that you're gonna go through a ton of material. No matter what book you get or what video you get, it doesn't matter. You're going to destroy a lot of beautiful rock before you finally get something pretty. And that's what happened to me. But after about six months, I was cranking out some good looking stuff. And I thought, man, I'm really getting this. And people would look at my stuff and go, man, you're good. And I thought, I'm good. <laughs> then I went to one of these fall heritage sort of days where the fire department's cooking chicken and there's pumpkins over there and these people make soap and they're selling brooms and here I am and I'm napping away. And it's going pretty good and I'm impressing the heck out of people. I'm thinking, man, I'm a napper now. <laughs> and this woman walks up and she looks at my stuff and women to tell you the truth. And she, and she goes, she looks at my copper bopper and she goes, Indians didn't have that. <laughs> and um, I got mad. You know what I mean? I really reacted, but it was like, I was just being honest. I'm Presbyterian. I got a lot of guilt. And I knew, I knew this woman is absolutely correct. And I'm busted. So I went home that night and I took all my copper tools, I put them in a box, I put them in the bottom of a bucket, and I covered it with rocks, and I never went back. This was the beginning of what I'm going to call my aboriginal phase of napping. But what, what it really meant was that was the birth of Pete. It was the death of Pete the Flint Napper, and the birth of Pete the Primitive Technologist. I went and got some hammer stones, like this, and I was still napping imported flint, and it took me about a year to get back to one third of the skill level that I developed with the copper. And I realized this is more difficult to obtain as a skill than I had ever thought. Within a couple of years, I got pretty good at aboriginal napping. That means everything in that tool kit is either antler, hammerstone, wood. And after about two years, two and a half years, I got a pretty good handle on that. And then I moved on. I moved on to quartzites. Now, if I wanted to be a pretty flint napper in Virginia, it'd be about the worst place to do it because there's no flint availability here. The flint resources are very small. When you look in these cases of artifacts, all of the smallest tools are made of flint. The biggest ones are made of quartzite. There's a reason for that. It's a practical matter of material availability in the Ridge and Valley province. The flints tend to be small. There are some bigger pieces of flint. So I became interested in quartzite. So in order to tell you the materials that I got into now exclusively, in the west face of the Blue Ridge, there are white quartzites somewhere in that picture from Fort Lewis. We call that the Irwin Antietam Formation. That's a Cambrian quartzite that formed in a shallow ocean um, 350 million years ago. I'm not that good on the time scales, but it's 
characterized by a trace fossil. It's a worm that occurs in the bottom. And I've napped this point. I made this one. I napped across the cleave, so I got the worms to expose. But that is a difficult material to master and to nap with control. I started napping that, and it probably took me about a year. I'm going to tell you all about the technology that Indians used to master these materials here that makes this area unique nationwide. Allegheny County is ground zero for a very unique form of napping. Just as I discovered that material, I also discovered the Rose Hill quartzites. Y'all recognize this mm -hmm. if you're from Allegheny County. The Rose Hill formation is part of the Clinton group. And the Clinton group runs from Birmingham, Alabama into upstate New York. But the nappable section of the Clinton really only runs from southern Rockingham County to Giles County. Allegheny County has the best of the nappable Clinton on earth. And that is the most napped material in this county. It is even more difficult to nap than the Antietam quartzites. The Indians wanted to make a big tool. I'm going to call them Indians if that's okay. They wanted to make a large tool, a multi-utility tool. A lot of what we find are not thrown and thrust weapons. They are handmade weapons that are used for knives and the myriad of tasks that confronted these people so they could survive. But they wanted a big tool. In order to do that, they had to master these quartzites. I want to go back now. I'm going to go back past 1970. I'm going to go back past 1959. I'm going to go all the way back 2.6 million years, just for a minute. I want to go to Tanzania for a minute and explain the origins of stone tool technology. <coughs> it turns out that one of our precursors, Homo habilis, lived in the highlands of Tanzania two and a half million years ago and discovered, probably accidentally, that if you hit two stones together, that you would drive off a flake. And they developed what is called the Oldowan technology. The Oldowan technology was named by Louis Leakey for the Aldivai Gorge. And what set that technology, and this is a pretty telling thing, for a million years, that Oldowan technology never changed. That means that it worked, and it worked very well. But it was a very simple technology. I wish I had some slides. Next time, I'll have a better stick together. But they basically made choppers, axes, gravers, and used the flakes. This went on for about a million years. And then suddenly, about a million years after that, about 1.7 million years ago, the technology comes up with the advent of a new species, Homo heldebergus. Now things are exhibiting increasing levels of refinement, symmetry, things are starting to be attractive and they're getting more complicated. That lasts for another million years. At the end of that, about 130,000 years, there's a sudden profusion of diversity in napping as humans begin to radiate out of Africa into Asia, southern Europe, and it's a new species now, and that's Homo sapiens, and that's us. So as they radiate out, the technologies become incredibly more complex, and as they become more complex, there's a theory that the brain size of our species began to rapidly increase. There is a theory that's pretty commonly held that stone tool technology, the complexities inherent in it, forced our brains to increase in size to accommodate the trigonometry involved in complicated fractured, stool, uh, fractured stone technologies. So at that point, things begin to change much more rapidly. Technology works that way. It's like this, it's like this, then it changes like this, and then it changes like this. Sound familiar? When <laughs> I, I'm working on a property in my hollow. They moved out in 1946. People never had electricity. They had a dirt floor, and they raised five kids. The kids all did well. That's 80 years ago, 75 years ago. They never even had electricity. 
When I sat down with Jack Reeves, my family had three channels of television. So what I'm kind of getting at is that technology from your Apple Watch to the gas pump to your satellite dish or whatever is in a straight line all the way back. And I'll try to explain that a little more fully. By about 15,000 years ago, as Mike said, there was a, a migration into the Americas. People fight over this all the time. But we think that the Clovis people came across the Bering Land Bridge and began to radiate down rapidly into America. And by the way, Virginia has as many Clovis sites per acre as any state in the United States. We're right up there with Florida for that. Clovis people brought with them a really complex bifacial technology. What that means by bifacial is that both sides are flaked with what we call direct percussion. Direct, I'm not going to take a flake, I'll just show you. Direct percussion means you hit the edge of the preform and knock off a flake. And there are other methods by which stone is reduced, but direct percussion under real skill and control using the best rock was the hallmark of Clovis people. And they came in hunting now extinct mastodon and mammoth and ice age mammals. And some people theorized that they were so good at what they did that they wore them out. Uh, but those things went extinct probably 10,000 years ago. At that point, tool styles begin to change. You begin to have things with notches in the bases instead of that fluted lamp-shaped thing with the flutes in the sides. Things begin to take on all kinds of morphologies and they last for a few thousand years and then they usually transition into another thing. By the end of in-place stone tool technology in Virginia, this was the terminal form. That's an arrowhead, just a triangle. It was that simple. They didn't need big packages of flint to do that. So the technology changed over time, but I want to get back to where we are. If I wanted to be a pretty rock napper and get lots of accolades, I wouldn't want to live here. But if I wanted to be a hard-headed technologist and have a hard time doing what I'm doing, this is the best place because we have the urban quartzite in the Blue Ridge and we have the purple quartzites here. Now, we don't know how innovations come in technology. This is all the Indians leave us to look at. The organic stuff is all gone. But we do know that they wanted to make a large tool. And this is an Allegheny thing and a Rockbridge County thing and a Bath County thing. And you saw the slides. The biggest things in the slides were quartzite things. The fracture properties of quartzite are different from flint. It's extremely brittle. I call it intractable. It's almost impossible to nap this stuff. When you try to nap it with a hard hammer, with the hammer stone, even with the piece of antler, it blows up in your hand. Somewhere along the line, an Aboriginal Virginia or an Aboriginal North Carolinian realized that if that hammer was really soft, that the tool survival rate would be a lot higher. And that's where our local technology was born. They found out that if you took a dogwood tree, pulled it out of the ground, stuck it in a fire, and burned it round, cleaned it off, that that would make the ultimate billet to reduce quartzites. Okay, so wooden billet flaking technology is sort of unique to our region. And there are certain diagnostics of the method that are very telling. As a primitive technologist, and no longer that much of a collector, I learn more from flakes and debitage. Debitage are what we call the byproducts of napping. I learn more from that stuff than I do from the finished tools because those flakes will tell you everything about the energy that was required. What? Sorry, I mean to interrupt you, go ahead. What happened? Oh, Pete, sorry for the interruption. I was just gonna suggest if you don't object while you're doing that, I'm gonna pass around some pieces of Rose Hill Please do, and I got a couple I want to pass around too. And when we get done, if y'all want to, feel free to look at all this stuff. Everything from here to here is artifactual. Everything else is a reproduction that I've done. 
And the stuff that I do is unique because I insist on using the means by which we think that they produced the tools originally. So I've gone from being focused on results to being focused on the process. And that's really one of the hallmarks of primitive technology. It's a process-driven kind of thing. These guys figured out that you can nap quartzite with wood and it, it brought on kind of a revolution because this meant now they didn't have to go hunt down the rock. They could get the rock right here in Allegheny County. Now, how do we know that they napped with wood? Something happens when you take a billet with wood. Let me know if I've gone on too long. When we take a wood, I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> when we take a flake from quartzite with wood, a couple things happen that don't really happen as much when you do harder hammer percussion or use an antler. This billet comes into the side of this preform onto the platform that I've prepared at the right angle. And when that billet hits that platform, it bends a little bit in a nanosecond. It begins to spread out and conform to that platform. And it pushes enormous compression onto the underside of that platform, again, for a nanosecond. At the end of that compression force, tension tears off the flake. It all happens so fast you think it's all one thing. Tension and compression exist in our universe like this. They're denying to each other. And stone is a lot stronger under compression than it is under tension. If I took a dry laid cinder block wall, I could kick it over. But I could put a Sherman tank on top of it and it would hold it up. And that's an exaggeration, but that's kind of how it works. But when you tear off that flake with that compression, something happens. There's an artifact of that moment of energy and that initiation and detachment of that flake. And that artifact is a pronounced lip that occurs around the edge of that platform. That only happens for a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, but it's long enough to leave that lip as an artifact of that wood initiation. Now, in academia, there used to be a lot of disagreement. Did they use wood? Didn't they use wood? In 1980, my, my teacher, my quartzite napping teacher, Jack Cresson, who's a professional archaeologist, went down to Wythe County and met up with Mike Barber, who was the head archaeologist for the National Forest at the Horse Heaven site. And the Horse Heaven site was a big quartzite quarry in the Blue Ridge. And they sat down for 10 days. For 10 days, the archaeologist picked up debitage out of the quarry and brought it in and analyzed it. And Jack sat there and wailed away with that wooden billet on that quartzite. And what they found is that his debitage, the wood-struck debitage, was identical to what they were finding in the site. So that hopefully settled that bet. So wooden billet technology is really unique to where we are. And I thought maybe I'd try to take a flake, just one flake. It's kind of a show busy thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit dangerous. Before That's you do, why Pete, I like it. Before you do, Pete, uh, I think I swamped the audience. So, uh, you know, I put something different in each row. So be sure. Send it around and you'll see what I mean. That lip that on nice. the reverse side indicates the compression and then one other thing and then and then we'll uh, we'll duck um, <laughs> so this this rose hill is a metamorphosed sandstone right all of our rocks are sedimentary and and it's a sandstone but it's a sandstone that's been metamorphosed into a quartzite yeah and if i might elaborate for a second Please. what makes the irwin antietam of the blue ridge different from the slightly younger depending on your point of view with this stuff rose hill quartzites on the west side of the valley in the allegheny front is that the irwin antietam has been deeply buried in the mantle of the earth so deeply that it's nearly remelted back into pure quartz so it's welded together by heat so it's a glassy, beautiful, homogenous stuff. 
used silica. It is, and there's a flake, and it, it admits light, and it's pretty stuff. It's pretty hard to nap. <laughs> the rose hill quartzites are different. They've been welded back together by water and iron. Yes. So when you're on the top of our highest ridges here, and you see a field of rock, a talus field, scree, of all of this loose plate-like rock that's plum colored, that's the Rose Hill, right? And again, if you heard what Pete just said, this rock is really high in iron content. So not only is it really hard, but it's a rock made out of metal. It's got a high iron content. Which if you don't get metal, the next best thing to the advent of metal is a rock that behaves there are theories that that's why they picked it. Yep. Above and beyond pure availability and quantity. So let me do one thing to get out of Pete's way. How many of you have I heard? Hurt you. Well, <laughs> I've seen you in action. How many of you have heard of a of a location on the top and the south end of Peter's Mountain called Jingling Rocks? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm going to try to get yes. my plate to hit there. Yeah. Well, this is what we're referring to. This is the Rose Hill material. If you go on top of Warm Springs Mountain or Peter's Mountain, our highest mountains. Yeah. The right. highest strata, which remember our, ba our basement strata, <laughs> right? Because of that. yeah. that's the Rose Hill. And it's often in these rock fields that it looks like somebody backed the dump truck up and spilled all of this plate like rock. Um, so, jingling rocks. Here is a handful of change. You hear the metallic quality of the coins. Can you similarly hear the metallic quality? of these rock chips. This is a high, a high iron content sandstone. All right, Pete. Wait a minute. Cor, I picked this up a couple weeks ago over on the James, I think. The way that I do this, I try to follow a structure with some convexity and a flake will not run into a concavity. It wants a convexity. When you nap with wood, it's different. You want a wide platform and you see that flake has a wide platform remnant. That's the part of the core that accepts the energy from the blow, okay? And the preparation of that platform is critical because it has to have the right angle. So this is the right angle. I'm not saying I'm gonna get a flake, I'm just gonna try to get one. But this is the right angle and the right surface contour to make a flake run. But that edge is still a little bit sharp and that sharpness will crush and rob the energy from the blow and my flake will fail. So I take my hammer stone. Hey, Pete, make I, sure you're turned this way so I can see you. Okay. All right, show business. There you go. <laughs> I go ahead, <laughs> I abrade this edge. What does that mean? What does that word mean? I'm abrading. What does that mean? So I'm grinding off the high places so they don't oh. snatch the oh. energy from the blow because you'll end up taking the energy of the blow to knock little pieces off. So I'm going ahead and grind them off now. So that, would that be considered like filing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say that. And um, I'm gonna grind a little bit along the ridge that this flake wants to follow. You'll find a lot of flakes where that dorsal ridge has been abraded. That's a standard technique by both the Rose Hill nappers and the Irwin quartzite nappers. This stuff's a little easier than the purple to nap and that's why I'm doing this with this stuff because purple stuff has a high failure rate. Is there a grain to this stuff or is it? There is. We call that the slaty cleave. And when you're napping this stuff, you take advantage of that slaty cleave. And that's usually its original layering and deposition. And if you try to violate the slaty cleave, sometimes you can do it, sometimes it doesn't work. Where did the term napping come from? Napping, I think that's an English term that was applied to the gunflint makers. Could you turn a little bit just toward the camera? Thank you. <laughs> Talk to my agent. I'm either, I'm either going to have to move or you're going to My manager is so over this stuff. You want to go in there? I would prefer yeah. to go. Okay. Hey, wait. Like the flint that has a particular directional grain. Is that correct, Pete? 
Sometimes yes, sometimes you can overpower. Mm -hmm. Quartzite is completely unpredictable in that regard. It's so hard to nap, I don't know why I do it, but... <laughs> you may have noticed. Those two frames on the right, I want you to look at them because I did everything in those two frames. The chips that you had were a large chip and a very small chip. Okay. And, and I have, as I'm sure Pete does, Rose Hill chips that are a quarter inch. This is the billet. I've taken this and put it in a campfire a couple days ago, and that burned off all the chaff and got me back to good hard wood. It drove the water out and it hardened the wood a little bit. And you fire treat your billet in order to get it, get it to where it will remove a flake. They get spongy and start to bounce off. So the idea, Jack Crescent calls it peeling the flake off. You want to come down, push this structure into massive compression, and then the dragging of the billet puts the tension in the edge of that flake where that little lip is that y'all are passing around. And if I've done it right, that flake should run probably just this far. I don't know. You're right. I'm just kidding. Uh, you ain't kidding. You ain't fooling. I'm being short. Set up straight mark. Incoming. Oh. Nice. All right. Yeah. I lost my platform. Oops. There we go. And you've got. Y'all can pass that around. There's a good wood struck flake, but it broke in two. There's another piece there. Piece there. Yeah, that's yeah. from, I, I, I was in rehearsal. Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> that is so cool. This is the point of impact. You see wow. But dogwood is uniquely durable. Okay, as Mike told you, the bow made its appearance in Virginia about 500 AD. And that's when the points got small. That was good because they could now get a lot out of their flinty material. But prior to that, projectiles were bigger and we didn't have the bow yet. Now, a little bit of anatomy and physics at the same time. Let's say I'm sitting behind an oak tree and the acorns are falling pretty good and I hear something coming. Here comes a big old bear and I want to kill him because I want to eat. If I throw this with my hands, this is all the energy I'm going to get. I'm not going to hit the wall. It's pretty good, but there's also a pretty good chance that it's going to bounce off of him. And then he may come after me. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's all the question of who gets eaten, right? That's right. Yeah. That's half the fun. <laughs> Somewhere along the line in Europe, probably 40,000 years ago, Somebody realized that you could multiply this energy and they probably took their cue from an animal. What if I was a deer? I would have a scapula, a humerus, a radius and an ulna, and my wrist and then I have a whole other bone that humans don't have. We call that the cannon bone. And that's one of the longest joints in the limb and that confers enormous strength and leverage onto that limb and that's why you can jump this high, but a deer can jump 20 feet in one jump. Somebody figured out that by extending the arm and giving yourself the equivalent of a cannon bone, that you could have such exponential force delivery increase that this would blow this dart right through the body of the animal. And so this is how the thing works, or worked, or works. Thunderbirdadelattle.com, my buddy Bob Berg made this. This is kind of a modern thing, but it's good for showing people the principle. Next time I'll have an ABO one with stone tips on it. But the launch works like this. If you're in the resting form, you're waiting. He's coming around the tree. His head goes behind another tree. This is it. I'm going to have to support the dart. You come forward, that hook pushes that dart forward with a fast acceleration, and that thing leaves with the speed of a bow. Only this weighs about 20 times more than an arrow. So this is a lethal projectile. 
So that's how the atlatl throw works. I'm not doing a good job of it because I don't want to throw it in here. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> Wait a minute. You want me to try it? I'll get it on video. We'll pick it up on the <laughs> That's the principle. And Pete? Yes, sir. Is it accurate in saying that most of the projectile points yes. that surface collectors pick up yes. were on this object? Yes. On and the this apple. was widely used, and the darts could have been eight or nine feet long. Mm -hmm. This is about a six foot dart. But that's the throw. Now, I'm, I want to, I'm not, I've tried this all day and it worked at home, y'all. <laughs> Yeah. That's the throw. But when you go to Adelaide competitions and you see the people that can hit the pie plate at 40 yards every time, and they really are out there. This is the basic form that that throw takes. So that dart really flies. Now, there's a problem with the system because deer have good eyes and bears have fairly good eyes, eh? Sometimes they do. Sometimes he walks right up to you. <laughs> if you're sitting like this, that thing's front heavy. And you're going to get tired. So they came up with an idea they call the paddle out of weight or banner stone. And they would affix another rock back here to counterweight that guy to put that balance point under the hand. Then they could sit there all day long and wait for their shot. That is a banner stone that I found in 1990. I don't know anyone that's ever found one, but I found one. And that's what they look like. And they probably conferred a lot of talismanic power to the owner because we find tremendous numbers of them in burials. They tend to be buried with, as a high status item. Anyway, so that, I'll do better next time. That's why they're not airheads. <laughs> ATL, 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 ATL. Addle, 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 addle. <laughs> How would they attach the tip to it? To the Adelaide itself? The stone, itself? The stone to it. Oh. And, and what was that? What would the Good dark, question. What would the dart be made of <clears throat> kind of material? River cane would be the primary choice because in Aboriginal times, river cane was up all of the streams. But with the advent of grazing and agriculture, it became effectively extinct. So it's now in about 1% of its original range. There's, there's river cane in Allegheny County, small patches. That banner stone typically was drilled through the center section and affixed by another piece of wood that came out of the Adelaide. This one's a tie-on, no hole. That's probably why I found it in one piece. Okay, do I have eight minutes to do the peck and ground stuff? Seven. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of burning up. I've, I've got ADHD too, so. In 2016, I met a guy named Scott Silsby. And he began to educate me in what we call battered and abraded stone technology. That's a fancy way, my hippie friends call it pick and grind. But what that means is that instead of knocking off flakes with control or lack of control, the tool is formed by pecking, one peck at a time. It's a little less violent but a lot more tedious than the quartzite napping. Stone dust. <laughs> That's the method, and things can be amazing. Things can be made with patience. Here's one. There's a groove deck. I've got about 90 hours. Probably about 60 to 70 thousand pecks in this core, and then you grind them down. You polish them. He's going into a handle, but I'm lazy and I haven't gotten around to it. <laughs> I did this in the 2016, 38,000 pecks, 35 hours, another 12 hours of grinding. So these were high value items.
for the Aboriginal people. You made the axe. Larry Kinsella has an axe at Cahokia. You mentioned Cahokia. He's their interpretive guy. He's got an axe at Cahokia that he's cut down 5,000 trees with the same tool. He's never resharpened. Wow. As long as you use this thing in green wood, it will last perpetually. What that means is these also end up in high status burials all the time. The nicest ones they find in grave contexts all the time. So that's the peck and grind thing. That's the short form. This is what we call a grooved axe. There's a hole in the handle here, drilled with a stone drill, and the sinew of two white-tailed bucks. The fibers off of the tenderloin have been pounded dry moistened in the mouth and gone back through that hole until that hole was full and then the whole thing over wrapped with rawhide that will never come off um, this is set up so that if, ever, if it ever gets loose a wedge can be driven in here to tighten it back up that was a later design over the full grooved axe of greater antiquity that tended to flop in the handle after it had been used for a few months so this is what we call the three-quarter groove design. This one actually has a trestle pocket for when I get this thing on the handle, I'll be able to drive that wedge in as I make the ax. If he begins to flop, pop him over, hit your wedge and keep working. This technology is like all the others. The full groove stuff lasted for about six or 7,000 years three-quarter groove for about 2,500 and then people got smart and they figured out that if you just made I'm going to try to knock it out of the handle <laughs> maybe I better not do floor. that <laughs> floor. Huh? The floor. <laughs> yeah I just don't want to break the bed <laughs> <laughs> that if you cut a socket into a branch and just put the thing in there, it'll last forever. And you don't have to worry about the lashing and the tightening. This is set up. I made this whole thing with stone tools. It took about 40 hours to make this and probably about 12 to make this handle. I made it with the stone edge, with this edge right here. Are you saying that came later? That's yeah, this is the terminal form. When, when people came to Jamestown, they were using these things to make the villages. Mm -hmm. Think about stone tool woodworking was real important to them. But this is set up so that it only bears high and low, and you can see daylight through the sides. Theoretically, that'll never split. So we call that the full grooved axe the three-quarter grooved axe in the terminal form for American Indians is the CELT, C-E-L-T. And uh, come up and look at them if you want. I'm kind of proud of them. I've got a lot of time. Imagine using that tool to cut down a tree large enough to then 